going to go ahead and stand up with us. We're going to get started with worship this morning. you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop even when even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop even when even when you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop way maker way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are Light in my 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing that out, you are one. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in my darkness, my God, that is who you are. And you are waymaker, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in my darkness, my God, that is who you are. don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, even when Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, waiting miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are way maker way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you
promise comes my way when I feel your hands of grace rest upon me staying desperate for you God and staying humble at your feet I will lift these hands and praise I will believe I remind myself of all that you you bought me you purchased me and there is no return you're never gonna leave me you're never gonna forsake me the hope that lives in you lives in me and in this world today we need more hope than ever before amen oh, love came down and rescued me love came down and set me free
sometimes we have to remind our soul. And if those of you understand what the word soul means is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And a lot of times I know, especially in this last few, uh, few days that we've just been overloaded with so much inconsistency and so much untruths. I have had to remind my soul that I still belong to Him. And I have had to remind my will and my mind and my emotions that He is still God and He is still on the throne. And Mike posted a thing on Facebook just last night. He said, the kingdom has not changed. The kingdom is His righteousness. Has His righteousness changed in our lives? Has His peace changed in our lives? And has the joy of the Holy Spirit changed in our lives? That's what we have to remind our, our soul about, that I am forever His. This world did not give me the joy. Has any of y'all experienced joy from this world? A little bit. But the kind of joy that I'm talking about is the joy in the Holy Spirit. So this week, sing out and remind your soul whenever you get overwhelmed that we are His. And tell Him, remind Him, remind yourself that I am yours forever. If He's been good to you, give Him a hand clap of praise. Father, we thank you. We give you honor in this house today, Jesus. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Man, you can be seated if you'd like. You don't bother me if you stand, so just FYI. Get some lights on in here. I want to see all of you. Good crowd today. Several visitors here today. We want to welcome all. Can you help me welcome all the visitors again today? We want to make you feel welcome, don't we, Ava? <laughs> Hope you feel welcome. We've got special things going on today, and uh, excited about this. One of the uh, most honorable things that I get to be involved with is baby dedications. I believe, or what a, one of the biggest privileges that I get to be involved with is dedicating babies. And uh, how many know that what you commit unto God, He doesn't forget? Right. Amen. When you put Him first in everything that you do, and, and there's so many principles with this, and I didn't bring my notes to get into all the baby dedications uh, stuff today because the couples um, that are dedicating today. Um, have been here and, and heard all this, and for the sake of time, we have baptisms at the end as well, and I'm going to preach an hour and a half in the middle, so it's going to be a long day if we go very long with those. But if uh, a couple a couple other things I want to, or one more thing that I want to mention, um, how many remember the first Sunday of October, what that's about? Tell your neighbor it's a big deal. Tell them it's a big deal. You need to be here. Amen. What we just, what, what, it's a pack the house weekend, pack the house weekend. And so what we're asking is that all of you who attend this church on a regular basis or call this your church home, or those of you that watch online and are within driving distance that don't attend another church, we want you to be here. We'd just like to see everybody here and get to know everybody, uh, see your faces get to meet some of you that watch online that we haven't been able to. I see some of you here today that have been watching online uh, and appreciate you being here. Uh, one lady, I think this lady messaged over, over here yesterday, and uh, we want you to know that we do appreciate you, and we do want to get to know you, and uh, you might be surprised how many people attend your church. <laughs> hey, man, I'm going to get into that in a little bit. I'll be a little harder later, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, we need to get into the the dedications today, so if we could ask these two couples to come up this morning and bring these babies up here. I'm going to set this out of the way there. I don't have
have my certificates. Could you grab me those? Please? Aren't these beautiful families? Amen. We have Crew Dawson Keysweater and Laney Rose Mace this morning. Would you guys mind to get together and back up that way just a little bit, keep you in the center of it? I'm going to kind of step off to the side here this morning. But the principle of baby dedication uh, started way back in Scripture. Most of you know that, of dedicating the firstborn uh, back under the law. To Moses was one example, uh, the, the primary example that we use and that we believe in dedicating our children to God is, is based on Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple to commit him to God, not law-based, even though that was a law-based uh, situation at that time, but it's the principle of what you commit unto God and that when we put our children in the hands of God, so to speak, by faith, and we say, God, as parents, we are, are dedicating this child. We are committing to raising this child under the fear and admonition of you. We're going to be the best example that we can be as parents, godly parents, to serve you, to put you first in everything that we do. And we are trusting you with this child's life. We don't believe that uh, dedication uh, necessarily saves the child. I, we believe that children are covered until the age of accountability, and I think God is the one that knows that age and opportunity for them, but there's still a principle involved here, and that's what we are here to observe today and to celebrate with these families and these babies. Amen? Amen. And so we just want to pray over them. If you would, stand with me this morning. If you want to stretch forth your hand, you're more than welcome to. We believe in laying hands on people and praying for them. I'm going to pray for these babies and, and just declare life over them and protection, plead the blood of Jesus. But would you join me in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, as we come to you today for these children, Father, I'm reminded of Simeon when they brought Jesus in before the temple and before the priests to dedicate him. And you began to prophesy, and Simeon began to prophesy and declare who Jesus was. And Father, today, I just declare and prophesy over these children your blessing and your hand and your will to be done in their life. I plead the blood of Jesus over their lives. Father, I pray that you not only protect them, but you guide them and shield them. I pray for these parents this morning, God, that you would give them the wisdom the knowledge, the direction, the strength to raise these children in this day and time. Father, I thank you that these children were born for such a time as this. I give you praise today for each one of their lives and for the generations that will come behind them. And Father, I, we, we lay hands on them and we declare that your hand is upon them and your mark is upon them, God, as we commit them to you for your kingdom and your glory. We know that they are a gift from you. You said in your word, all children are a gift from you. And we receive these gifts and God, we turn around and we say, these are yours and we know that. And we're going to do the best we can to raise them and to teach them in your ways and your principles. I plead the blood of Jesus. I declare your blessing, your protection, your provision for them all the days of their life. In the name of Jesus, I declare these will be world-changing people unto generations to come. And we give you praise for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Would you give them one more hand this morning? I'll get you these certificates after because i need to sign them but they're not signed thank you guys so much for who you are i've had the privilege of marrying one of the couples and being at the wedding at the other one <laughs> when my when jessica and brendan got married they just allowed me to be the dad and i'm thankful for that but uh, these are great couples god's got great things in store for them are you smiling at me are you? i'm funny looking yeah Amen. Well, thank you, guys. You can be seated if you would like. We'll let the kids be dismissed to Children's Church.
What you got? Oh, that's fine. That's for a different part. How many are thankful today? Amen. Amen. Three or four of you, that's good. Hopefully the rest of you get there before the end of the service. I want to pick up where we left off last week um, in the book of 1 Kings. Um, I was wanting to, wanting to preach and teach on baptism today, water baptism. We're going to have some baptisms at the end of service. Uh, we'll have baby dedications and baptisms um, the, the rest of this month, each Sunday. Some, we tried to spread them out because I think we have, was it 13 baby dedications and I think six or eight uh, water baptisms. And so we're thankful for that. And we, so we wanted to spread those out different weeks and different uh, People have family members they're trying to, to have here for those things and such. So um, if you have your Bibles, go with me to 1 Kings. What? I did dismiss the kids. They're gone, baby. You better get back there. <laughs> Y'all pray for, pray for your kids this morning. <laughs> I hope somebody's back there with them. That's good. That's good. I like it when somebody besides me makes a mistake. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm pretty good at it. Um, but if you have your Bibles, go with me, if you would, to uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. And I'm going to read through the scriptures that we started with last week just to kind of to familiarize those of you that might have not have been here. If you haven't watched last week, it would probably help where we're going this morning to help you understand. But I'll try to recap just a little bit. The main point of what I was after last week, and then I want to go forward in this story because there's something in my heart or in my spirit, if I can say it that way, uh, lately. I, I'm a realist. I have a lot of faith. I, I don't say that arrogantly. I, I'm a faith person. I believe in faith. I believe in miracles. I believe in all the signs and wonders, the gifts of the Spirit, the whole shebang. Amen. But I'm also a realist, and I, I'm not going to deny reality when it's in front of me. Um, how many know that you can uh, admit that there has been a diagnosis, but at the same time you can still declare the Word of God and have faith? You can admit that there is a problem that I'm dealing with, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that you don't have faith. Uh, I, I don't believe in just sticking your head in the sand or uh, living in denial about stuff. But I do believe in declaring the Word of God and the power of the Word of God over situations. And I've come to the place in my life that I would rather have faith, believe God, declare the Word of God, and be wrong and die. As I would to not believe the Word of God, not declare the Word of God, live depressed, down, and frustrated, and without hope all the days of my life. Anybody else understand? You get what I'm saying? And so, because I've tried it both ways, and it's way better this way. And I, I, I don't claim to understand why God heals at certain times, why he doesn't heal certain times, why he does show up in certain ways and it's miraculous and it's like, the, you know, he really came through this time and then another time you pray and it doesn't seem like he comes through. I'm not God, so I can't explain that to you. And I'm not going to pretend to. But I will never stop declaring the word of God. I will never stop standing up for what he says, and I will never stop as much as within me listening to his voice and declaring what he says and following his lead. The Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And how many know God's not after servants today? God's after sons. Jesus was the firstborn among many sons, and God is after sons. A real son will serve. You don't have to worry about that. I, if you have a real son that's been raised right and they understand honor and respect, how many know they'll serve anyway? But uh, we, we've got to lose this mentality that we are servants only and that, that we are not family. 
that we are not part of God's family. He's not our heavenly father. That's not just a, a statement that we make or a, uh, uh, something that we say half, haphazardly, but it is a true fact. And so I want to pick back up in this story. Last week we talked about this story with the king uh, Ahab and Jezebel and the spirit of Jezebel. And I just give some, some instances of how you can tell when that spirit is dealing with you. And that if you are in ministry at all, and you don't have to be in ministry, but if you are in ministry at all, you will deal with that spirit. Because it is a spirit that hates men of God and women of God. It hates the word of God. And it is a controlling spirit that wants control. And it's not just that it's on someone else and they try to control you or just a spirit that gets on you. How many know that we can all clear down from in a region to a, a community to a group of people to a person, someone else, even yourself. There's something within our flesh that we want to be in control. Amen. And I took you clear back to the garden where that started last week, where, where God told Eve, he said, your, your desire will be for your husband. And that truly means when you study it, that your desire will be for his position because he said he will rule over you and we are the bride of Christ. And when you look at that in metaphorically in type and shadow, you realize that, that we are the bride of Christ and in our fleshiness, it is, it is our struggle sometimes to try to be in control and we want to be in control and, and we have a, a, a plan or we have an outlook on how the situation should be. And we want God to come alongside us and do what we want. But sometimes his ways are higher than our ways. And so I'm going to read through these scriptures real quick. And it says, verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. This is right after he had slain the false prophets, called fire down from heaven, and, and slew the false prophets. And also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. We talked about this last week. When you, One of the ways you can identify the spirit of Jezebel trying to get on you and deal with you is you get to the point you're so hopeless and you just wish you could die. He wanted to die. He prayed that he said, God, I just, I just as soon die. If this is how it's going to be, if this is the way life is, if this is how it's going to be in my life, I just as soon die. It is enough. Take my life for I'm no better than my father's. And then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, we stopped there last week, but as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly the angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time. And touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. And so he arose and ate and drank, and he went into the strength, he went in the strength of that food forty days. Everybody say forty days. Forty days he went in the strength of that food, and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave, and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. He starts telling God about all he's done. Anybody ever been in a place where you're down and depressed, and you're feeling sorry for yourself, and you said, I'd just as soon die, and then God checks you on it, and then you start the whininess? Maybe I'm the only one that's done that. I, I don't know. Ryan, help me out here. Um, but he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel. I've forsaken, the, the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars. They killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left. I'm the only one left, God, that really knows. I'm the only one left that's doing it right. Go ahead. 
And they seek to take my life. Now they're after me. David prayed a prayer very similar to this too. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Same question. And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. It's like he didn't think God heard him the first time. And they seek to take my life. And then the Lord said to him, go, return your way, on your way, to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahalah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Heziel, Jehu, will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha, will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I want to stop and go back to about verse 6. And I want to carry on from where we left off. Verse 5, let's go verse 5. Let's pray before we get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you today and I ask you humbly to anoint me. God, let, let the people hear you today and not me. God, help us to open our ears and our hearts to receive the word to be planted deep within us. I ask, God, that we be good soil today. I ask that we hear this word and not only hear this word but receive it. In times like these, Father, we need your word. We need your strength even if it hurts our feelings. And I give you praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to back up in, in the, and start back with this verse, but I don't know about you, but have you realized that we uh, are in some pretty chaotic or troubled times? Tell your neighbor, things are jacked up. They're pretty jacked up. I'm a realist. I started with that. I'm not going to deny the fact of what's going on. I'm not going to deny the fact of the agendas uh, from both sides of the aisle, if you want to say it that way, and the enemy, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I, I'm not going to negate the fact that there is an enemy and that there is a plan and there is still evil going on in the world today. And all as it is is because people are broken and hurting and they don't know the Father. And so they continue to try to live in the flesh and live worldly and, and, and have control and uh, rule because they want control and they think they know better than God. If it, wouldn't, it wasn't so, that's why people make the decisions to abort because the Bible says all children are a gift from God. If God gives you a gift, why would you smoke that gift? Why would you kill that? Amen. And a lot of people say, they begin to reason, well, what about rape? What about this? What about that? My Bible says all. Everybody say all. It's the same word all that says all things work together for the good of those that call God or those who are called of God according to his purpose. Love God and called according to his purpose. If it wasn't a, a control issue, uh, then, then why do we try to uh, persuade things and get things? And, and we think that we, need, that we know how many people should live on the planet or who shouldn't live on the planet and where they should live and how they should live. We think we've decided and we've, made, we've tried to put ourselves in the position of God. We've tried to, to get in his position. And, and when you do that, any time you do that, you, you, you set yourself up for failure. You set the world up, your, your, your surroundings in your own home, in your own setting, your own mind. You set yourself up for chaos. 
The prophet is in just that situation in this story, and we, we talked about it last week, and you have all these false prophets who are hired by the government even, and the church even, to prophesy so they could control and they could do these things. And I'm not trying to just, uh, I'm not preaching politics today. I'm preaching all the way across the board. This is something that God laid on my heart heavy in the night last week. And so he confronts the evil. He confronts the false. And he slays the prophets. And then he makes the queen mad. And she's going to kill him. And we talked about last week when he saw it, she painted him a picture with her words. I mean, the words paint pictures. I mean, you know, you can either look at the picture that the devil's painted, or you can look at the picture that God's painted with his word. It's our choice. It's always been our choice. This thing is not near as hard as we all make it. Amen. He said, I set before you life or death. Choose you this day. You can speak death or you can speak life. You can choose blessing or you can choose cursing. Any one of us at any time in our life can choose which one we want. And you reap what you choose. He's in this situation. He kills them all. And then the Bible says that she paints him this picture. And, and we, can't be, we can't believe, we can't understand that he's scared. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that he runs and he hides. And he runs from this one woman. And then he goes and he ends up, he runs quite a ways. Uh, most, most, most people believe that he went over 100 miles. after the, I'm, I'm sorry, I got the two mixed up. After this. Anyway, he, he runs until he's tired. And then as he lays and he slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Go ahead. I want to read these again. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate, and he drank, and he laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time. Everybody say the second time. What God is trying to get us to understand is you can't feed on the Word of God one time. Because the angel of the Lord came and gave him manna or gave him food to eat and water to drink. How many can see that as type and shadows, and I believe in those, as type and shadow, that is the word of God and it is the spirit of God. This man has obviously wore himself slap out trying to defeat all the falsehoods and the things in the world and trying to figure out who's really, who's really who and all this kind of stuff. And he gets confronted and he finally wears out and he runs from this in fear and he goes to the point to where he is exhausted and he finally does what God has been asking all of us to do all along and that is rest. Rest. I mean, no, rest is a weapon. Rest is one of the biggest statements of faith that you and I can do. We say, well, I don't know, but I'm not talking about lazy. I'm talking about just resting when it's time to rest. How many know God worked six days, and on the seventh day, he rested? So if you think you're tougher than God, hats off to you. You're going to end up under a tree crying out for your life one of these days. Amen? I'm just going to get real and get right for a little bit today. I'm, I'm really frustrated and struggling with the mentality in our world today, especially in the church, that we need to go to church about once a month. Well, God, quiet, not an amen right there. We need to go about once a month or twice a month. Did you know that statistically a, a committed churchgoer goes to church 2.1 times a week, a month? That's a committed one. Remember we talked about last week how we change, how people want to change truth? And they say that's committed. How many know that's not real committed? How many of y'all have kids play sports? How many know if they went to practice about twice a month, how many teams they'd play on? How many of us have jobs? And if we had that same statistical mindset and we called that a committed employee that comes to work about half the time, how many would have a good job? Oh, come on. But see, there's like this disconnect when it comes to God. We, we, we get this disconnect that we think we don't need God anymore, that we can just bow up and we can handle all this stuff and we can deal with the issues and we can deal with the, the evil that's confronting us and we can handle all this kind of stuff. How many know that you can't handle it? The angel said, this is too great for you. This journey is too great for you. And I'm here to remind us today that the things we're dealing with and the situations in our world today are too great for us. I can't figure this out. I can't handle this on my own. 
So that's why God tells us to stop sometimes and rest and let him feed you his word. How does he feed you his word? Well, here's a metaphoric example. He sends an angel, the word anglios, it's the same one we get pastor from in the New Testament. The angels of the churches, the seven churches who were in Asia, that word is anglios. Same situation, same deal. He sends an angel. It simply means messenger. And he, he, he wakes him up. I could just see him kick him. Wake up. Hey, wake up. That's how I feel like on Sunday. Come on. Hey, wake up. Elbow your neighbor. Wake up. I'm trying to tell you something. I'm trying to give you some food. I'm trying to give you some supernatural word of God. Not that I'm special. It has nothing to do with it. I'm just the mailman. It's the mail that you need to read. It's the word that you need to hear. Why? Because God sets people in the body as it pleases him. Not just pastors. But if you, this is your church, you have been set in this body because it pleased the Lord for you to be here. It's not an accident what tree that guy landed under. He thought he was just running from the woman. But he sets down because he's exhausted and he says, I need to, I got to rest. And he rests. And in the place of rest, the angel shows up and he says, I got a word for you. Eat it. <laughs> How many feel like I shove it down your throat some Sundays? <laughs> some people say, I felt so convicted. I said, Well, that was God, not me. I'm just the mailman. You guys know me well enough to know that, that I tell you all the time, I have to take the medicine before I give it to you. Sometimes I'm like, ow, I don't want to write that down. <laughs> that hurts. I, I have to go through the same thing. So it's not that I'm putting myself on a pedestal. I just know that I'm the mailman for this house. I mean, we all have different mailmans for where we live and where we're at. And God is doing this, and this is what I, I heard him say. He said, tell my people to eat my word. Because the journey is too great for you. I don't know about you, but if something doesn't change, we're fixing to see some stuff our generation's never seen before. We're fixing to see some stuff in our country that will rock your little world. We think we've had bad days because we had a hangnail or because our cell phone didn't work. I'm telling you, if something doesn't change and there isn't some drastic change, you ain't seen nothing yet. And you guys that go here know that I'm not a gloom and doom preacher. I'm a faith guy. I'm a forward guy and a positive guy. Man, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not there. I'm saying that we may have to hit it like a truck. And if we're tired and we're wore out and we're not feeding on the word of God and we're not spending time in the presence of God, in the spirit of God and having his spirit renewing us and building us back up, we are not going to have the strength for the journey that is before us. If you're a believer that Jesus is coming soon and he's going to split the sky and he's going to, and, and that kind of a mindset, that's great. You can believe that all day long. I'm not here to harp or, or tell you you're right or wrong about anything. You can believe that. That's fine. But with that belief comes even so much more as you see the day approaching should you be in the house of God. Amen. And for the, the, the ones that don't believe he's coming that way and that believe he's already came and he's here now and all that kind of stuff, it works the same way. How many know? Because we should continually be in his word, in his house. We ought to understand. If we understand kingdom mindset and the kingdom mentality, we understand that we are part of a kingdom and we are part of a family. And we need to unite as a family, not divide as a family. And we're, we're stronger together and we should come together more often and build each other up in our most holy faith. Encourage one another and build each other up in our faith. Amen? People want a nice, hard, sexy body, but they don't want to exercise, don't want to eat right, don't want to stretch. <laughs> Amen? Tell your neighbor it just won't work. You're not strong enough. You're not stretched enough. We hate stretching. Why? Because it hurts. We hate it when somebody feeds us the truth and we weren't really ready for it. But why? Because it hurts our feelings. But how many know the truth is still the truth and the truth produces one thing? Freedom. The truth, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you're not stretched out enough, that's why you hurt things in your body. That's what pulls you out of place in, in chiropractically, all those kinds of stuff. If, if you're not healthy in the way that you're eating, that's why you get sick more often. If we're dehydrated, just look in the physical sense and compare this metaphorically, spiritually. If you're not hydrated, most problems come from dehydration. 
We started out 70, 80% water when we were born. These little babies, 78%, 78% water when they were born. And by the time we get old, we get down to about 30%. Why? Because we quit drinking water. Why? Because it don't taste good. It's just so plain. It's the same every week. Spend time with God. Worship. I mean, you're the Word of God. You always want me to get in the Word. Get in the Word. There's a reason. Amen? Because there's something about feeding on the word that God gives you, whatever angel. And if you go to another church and you're watching online, get your hind end back to your church. Amen? But there's something about that. He said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Keep going. So he arose and he ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food. Forty days. You say, why are you making such a big deal about 40? 40 is the number of bondage in numerology in Scripture. It's 40 years they wandered around the wilderness. Why? Because they would never call it today. And what was God feeding them? Manna from heaven every day. Not once. Hey, eat this meal. You're good. Come to church, say a prayer, got saved, got my ticket to heaven. It's punched. I'm good to go. Now I can just live like a hellion, and I just know I'll go to heaven someday. Tell your neighbor that was never the goal. The goal is not heaven someday. The goal is heaven on earth. The goal is heaven here and now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Heaven doesn't need you. Earth needs you. <laughs> come on. Say hello, earth. <laughs> you need me. <laughs> Why? Because God put me here. He planted me here. He planted you in this church. He planted you in this community. He planted you in this situation. I'm just here to build you up today. you got to feed on that word of God. you got to spend time and allow the Holy Spirit to regenerate you and to build you up. Or otherwise, when crisis comes, you'll fold. And you won't make it. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. As far as Horeb, that was over 100 miles he walked. To the mountain of God. To the mountain of God. I don't know about you, but have you ever had a kid that wouldn't eat? I, I spent a lot of years, I tell people when they ask me about my education, I say, well, it's, it's pretty extensive. And they say, well, where'd you go to school? And I say, well, I spent four years with uh, Focus on the Family under James Dobson. Uh, I also spent four years under Michael Youssef. Uh, I spent four years under Chuck Swindoll, Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, I spent four years, and I just continue to list with Joyce Meyer, uh, four years under T.D. Jakes, four years under Clarence McClendon, four years under all kinds of people. And they say, what? I say, yeah, I drove a service truck every day. And I went from one program to the next 30 minutes a day. I was taught by the best every day. I fed on the word every day. I had a call on my life, and I knew what I was supposed to do. I couldn't quit and go to school, but I sat in that truck, and I went to school every day, and I fed on that word, and I fed on that word, and during the time that I was feeding on that word was one of the hardest times of my life that I ever went through, but you know what kept me going is every day I kept feeding on that word. I kept feeding on that word, and I would spend time alone with God. I would spend time in worship with God and fill my spirit up and let the Holy Spirit just rejuvenate me, and we walked through stuff that I never dreamed we could go through we had everything you could imagine hit us not everything but many things that you couldn't imagine hit us that we walked through and people would ask me how do you go through this or how do you do this it's what I was feeding on it's nothing to do with me I cannot do it in my strength you cannot do it in your strength but hear me today there's coming a time you better get your strength up you better get your spirit filled up you better drink the water from the Holy Ghost and you better spend time in the Word of God and with the God and get your self in the church and get around your family of God and get built up because we're going to need it. Amen. As a pastor, and especially recently, it has been like nonstop, day and night. We spend time in the day and we spend lots of nights with people, middles of the night. Different things like that. And I'm not trying to be mean this morning. But it's like maintaining your car. 
Your car doesn't break down near as often as if you maintain it. Our families don't break down near as often if we maintain them. Our relationships, our health, our, our, our anything in our life, it doesn't break down near as often if we maintain it. Amen? But you can't maintain something every once in a while or when you get in trouble, then you go to the mechanic. When you get in trouble, I tell people all the time, I wish you would have called me to help you with your marriage before you were on your way to the divorce court. It would have been a lot easier to fix this. Amen? Is this too tight? I wish you would have called me before. We could, have, we could have helped you with this. I could have given you some instruction. Not that I know everything. I don't, but I can give you the word of God. I will we'll be with you. We'll pray with you. We'll help you in this situation. But time and time again, it's like having a kid that won't eat. And, and if we don't make them eat, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, you ate what was on the table. Anybody grow up in my generation? Food was a privilege at my house, and I don't say that jokingly. When I was growing up, I didn't realize how, how hard times, the hard times that my parents were going through because they never made a big deal about it. They just made it work. And, but when it was time to eat, you ate what was at the table because there wasn't anything in between. Everybody say in between. <laughs> yeah. You ate because there wasn't anything in between. Snacks weren't around our house all the time. If it was a snack, it was something that had to be made. My mom, I'm sorry, mom, I love you. My mom would save everything. Anybody else have the yellow uh, Tupperware containers, the round ones, the big lid, and you had like the five different sizes of them? We had those. And my mom used to always hide anything that was a snack or a privilege from my brother and I. Uh, my sister had moved out when we got when we moved to Missouri. She was had graduated to move, so it was just my brother and I in Missouri, and that's where times were pretty tough. Mom would go get groceries about every two weeks to a month, and she would buy and, and she would cut coupons and she would do whatever she needed to do in order to feed our family. And she would get very creative with what we had to eat. She grew a garden. She did whatever needed to be done at that time during those hard times. But she was resilient, and, and so she would hide, like if she ever got pop or Coke, whatever you want, big debate on whether you call it pop or soda or whatever. We love pop because we never had it. And so it was always a deal for me and my brother to find it because she would hide it. And she would put it in the most unique places, like in the bottom of the hamper. She thought for some reason we wouldn't look there. I don't know. Teenage boys wouldn't look in the dirty clothes hamper. I, and she put it there. One time she put it in the dryer. She put it in the dryer underneath all the clothes so we wouldn't find it because she knew if we ever found it, we'd drink it all. And she'd save it. And so, like, we'd be working. It'd be hard, 100 degrees. We're hauling hay. we come in. We, she'd always make us hose off in the backyard before we could ever get in the house, you know, and, and take a bath and, and get cleaned up. It'd be hot. We'd be sitting there. Didn't have air conditioning. We had one sea breeze fan trying to blow through the whole house. It's humid in Missouri. And we're sitting there sweating, thinking ain't life great. And mom would go, man, wouldn't that Pepsi taste good right now? <laughs> we're hot. We're tired. We're wore out. Wouldn't, man, just, just a little Pepsi. We said, no, we'd like a big Pepsi. She said, well, let me see if I can find one. We'd be like... Ah. She she beat us again. But she would, and chips were a big deal. We didn't have chips very often. So when we had chips, she would save them. And when they'd get down to the bottom, bottom of the bag, I'm so thankful for you, Mom. We'd get down to the bottom of the bag, she'd dump them in one of those Tupperware containers. Partly to hide them, and the other part was to save them. But then when she'd get a new bag, she'd just dump those in there. And she, next thing you know, we had trail mix before it was ever invented. We had pretzels. We had corn checks. That, that we had peanuts in there sometimes. And cr a lot of crumbs. And sometimes, and that thing, and that, that would be our snack. I got way off track. <laughs> the point was this. You ate what was at the table. Because we knew we were going to need the strength to work. 
We knew we were going to need what she provided, what they provided for us to eat because we just knew we needed it. And when you're a little kid, I understand you have toddlers and they don't want to eat. And, 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 and again, I listened to Dobson for many years. I read a lot of his books. I agree with most of, most of his stuff. And he would talk about the mothers that would call in and they're just like, I just can't get my child to eat. I just, uh, I put food in front of them and they won't eat. And he'd say, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just put it away. But don't give them anything till next mealtime. Well, what if he gets hungry? I mean, could you, could you just hear him going, here's your sign. <laughs> yes, he's going to get hungry. This is the point. <laughs> Yes, he's going to get, he, he's not going to die because they're, well, what if he gets weak and passes out? He said, he'll be fine. Little Johnny will be fine. Just let him go till the next meal time. And I promise you, he'll eat the next meal. And if he doesn't, let him go to the next one. And then I promise you, he'll eat. It's just the, that common sense stuff. But, but, but so many times we, we, we don't want, we don't want to make our kids eat and then they don't eat. And then how many have ever had your kid come back 15 minutes after you washed the dishes? I'm hungry. How much I need? <laughs> and I'm not trying to be harsh as a pastor because none of you all in here are like this at all. <laughs> but I preach my guts out sometimes on a Sunday. And on Tuesday, the people that weren't here will call me. And they'll give me the list that fit the word I preach Sunday. And I'm like, did you, did you, did you watch the message Sunday? No. Go back and watch the message and call me back. Supper was on the table. Amen. And it's not because I'm special. It's because God loves you enough to send a mailman or a messenger in your house, in your place, give you a parent to feed you a meal, give you somebody that was preparing you for what you would go through that week. See, I get excited about it because I know it's God talking to me. It's not because, woo, I got a feeling. It's because I know that whatever I'm saying, you better get ready because God's always ahead of the curve. Amen? Yes, God will deal with my past and your past, and he'll heal that, and he wants to deal with that, and sometimes he does through the word. But he also deals with our future. How many know he was, and he is, and he is to come? That's him. He's in it all, and he knows what their next move is. He knows what your husband or wife's next deal, your kid, what they're going to go through. He knows what you're going to go through this week, and if you would get a hold of the word of God and you would eat what he gave you, it probably would make a big difference for your journey is this too hard arise and eat and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days that is so strong to me because of bondage I don't know about you but we, we drive down the road and we just kind of look at each other lately and it's almost like you kind of feel like you're in jail if you let it. If you think about what's going on, the fear that's, that's spread, the head game that comes with this corona thing. It's, it's not just, it's not, I'm not saying that, that it doesn't affect you when you physically get it. I get that part. But it's the emotional part of it that affects you, of the fear of it, the unknown of it. What about it? All the fights you can't talk about. You can't have conversations hardly anymore. You can't post anything anymore. Cause I got any kind of slant, either direction. Somebody's ready to fight. It's all part of the control. It's all part of the, the prison that you have no freedom and you just keep shrinking and shrinking and backing and running and going and hiding under a tree. And I, you just get to the point. It's like, I'm good. I'll go sit under a tree somewhere. I don't need people. <laughs> it's like I told you a few weeks ago. I don't even like people. And I got to preach. <laughs> don't take that personal. I was joking. I made that statement about three days later. I was scrolling through something. And I heard this preacher. He said, one of the signs that you can know that you're saved, if you want to know if you're saved or not, is do you love people? <laughs> I went, ow. <laughs> I just got up all smart aleck and said, I don't like people. And it's just like God to go, boop. Here's your sign. <laughs> Maybe I got to stop. I just... We, we talked about this last week about coming to the realization that God's already provided. The scripture, that's a scripture. Did you know that's a verse in the Bible that said he's already provided? 
He's already provided. The Bible says along with the temptation, he's provided, past tense, a way out. So when people tell me, I'm just so tempted, I'm just so tempted. Well, where's the door? Because it's there. I used to have a real addiction to Diet Mountain Dew. I'd drink six or eight of them a day, like water. Couldn't figure out, wonder why I wasn't healthy. I just couldn't figure it out. Didn't ever drink water. Drank Diet Mountain Dew. You know what's in Diet Mountain Dew? The mortician told me. It's almost the same thing as embalming fluid. Isn't that neat? Wonder why my body just kept getting tighter and tense and didn't move and I didn't feel like doing anything anymore. I'm just this walking embalming fluid. Man, I just don't feel as good as I used to. I'm getting tight. I'm getting old. Yeah, we'll try some water. That's what I tell people, church people. You ever been around church people that are all spiritually like this? Why? Because they've been feeding on embalming fluid for the word. They've been feeding on that old law-based dead stuff. Come on. And they wonder why they can't move. They wonder why they can't breathe. They wonder why they can't stretch. Why they can't do anything. Why? Because they're scared to death they're going to make a mistake. They're scared to death God's going to get them. I'm going to make a move. i got to do it. It's all about me, what I do. No, it's not about you and what you do. It's what him and what he did. And because he did that, now I can live and I can have life. But it's not a license for me to go sin and be stupid. It's a license for me to live life. Now I can drink the water freely. Now I can eat his food without fear or doubt or anything. I can just consume him more and more because the more I consume him, the more I become like him. He went right through bondage and lands on the mountain of God. Isn't that cool? Stand with me if you would. We got to stop. I just want I mean this with every all sincerity today. I can't speak for other churches, but I can I can say this with confidence. Most churches are not after your money. Most churches aren't bad. They're not evil. We're all trying to do the best we can with what we know how. Amen? And God is gracious enough and big enough to work in all of us. Amen? And I just believe because of what he woke me up in the night and told me and showed me that I think we're getting ready to come through a time where we need to be fed up. We need to be ready. I'm not trying to promote fear. I hate fear. I'm not afraid, but I do know that there's enemies to overcome and there's things that we have to deal with in our life personally, emotionally. We need to be healed emotionally. I would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers, and you've heard me teach this. So that means as your mind, will, and emotions prosper, You'll be in health. And if your mind, will, and emotions are prospering or healed, you're in health. How many know that everything else you do will be easy to prosper? But if you're trying to work, 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 and trying to get everything, it's all about prosper. It's all about being successful, whatever it is, making money, being successful, having a reputation, accomplishing a goal, whatever it is. And you're not healthy. You're not resting. And your emotions are jacked up. It doesn't matter what you achieve because you're going to lose it anyway. Or you're not even going to be able to be mentally, have the mental capacity to enjoy it or realize what's going on. I just want to see people heal. I want to see people whole. I want to see people live and accomplish the things God's called them to accomplish because everything is about him and his kingdom. No matter what you do, not everybody's a preacher, teacher. Not a, you can minister in every area of your life. That's my heart. That's my goal. We're not after your money. We're not, we're not trying to see how many people we can get here. This whole thing, uh, God really dealt with me about this thing in October. This is just to encourage you. 
Because when you go through these hard times and when we go through these situations like we're in right now, we have the tendency to be just like the prophet. Am I the only one that thinks this way? Am I, am I, that's, what, that's what he was saying. I'm the only one left, God. There's very few real Christians left. Nobody. That's why I want us all to show up together at the same time so we can have the epiphany or the, the realization like the prophet did when God said, hey, just take a look. By the way, there are 7,000 other people who have not bowed their knee to Baal either. And I'm here to encourage you. There's a bunch of people still believing in God. There's a bunch of people still serving God. There's a bunch of people still believing. We're just waiting and we're trying to do it the right way. We're not burning stuff down or, or wrecking everything. We're trying to do it the right way and the gracious way and whatever it is. And that's why it doesn't, we don't respond the same way. But I just, it's, it's it's the encouragement part that there are more than be more that be with us than be with them because that's the lie that's the picture that the enemy paints this thing's stronger than you you can't defeat this oh yes you can this there's there's more evil than good anymore and the world's just going to hell in a handbasket no that's not what your bible says the bible says that the <laughs> i got to get it don't allow the enemy to paint the picture Change the channel. We talked about it last week. Change the channel. Change the channel in your mind. What are you putting in? What are you feeding on? Did you, did you read your word today? Did you spend some quiet time today? Because we all need it. Especially for the journey we're about to go on. Again, I love you. I pray for you. I'm with you. But don't wait Till your engine starts knocking so loud that when you're driving down the street, people start yelling, saying, hey, is that a diesel? Start when the dummy light comes on. That's what we used to call them, the check engine light. Hey, dummy, there's something wrong. And I don't mean that, I don't mean that condescending. We're all, I'm as guilty as anybody. You're supposed to feel good physically. You're not supposed to hurt all the time. You're not supposed to fight all the time with your spouse and your kids. That's not normal, and that's not right. Are you going to go through things? Absolutely. But don't wait till it's too late. And don't wait till it gets to the point that it's so hard to fix. Just begin doing. You say, what can I do? Do your part. God's not going to answer, ask me about you. He's going to ask me about me. When you, when you stand before God, he's not going to say, well, you know, uh, you know, what about Bubba? Let's talk about Bubba. No. He's going to look me dead in the eye and he say, how was it with me and you? Did I know, did I know you? Do we, do we know each other? Remember the scripture? Stand before God and he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. And he's talking to people who were casting out devils. They said, yes, but we've done this, and we've done this, and we've done this in your name. And he said, yeah, but I never knew you. I mean, you can know about a lot of people, but know them is a different thing. And God wants to know us. He wants relationship with us. That's what he's after. I want relationship with him to the point that I can make it through that 40-day journey. That when, when sickness does come upon me, whatever it is, if it's this virus or another virus or whatever other virus that we've all been through already, there's going to be more that we can get through that. And I just got to hit this to be honest with you. Do you realize none of us get out of here alive? Here's the hard, cold fact. We're going to go one way or the other. You might as well settle that. Just freaking out about it ain't going to help you. And the Bible says, oh, we're back in that word thing again, that our days are numbered. God knows the number. So wouldn't it be good to just run with the guy that knows your number, to take advantage of every day that you have while you're here, knowing that I could drive down this road today and get hit by a truck and die, and that virus had nothing to do with it. Bow your heads if you would. Let's pray. Father, I've poured out what I believe that you showed me. And I thank you that your word is true. 
I thank you that you didn't send it to bring us down. You sent your word to heal all our disease. You sent your word to redeem us. You sent your word to buy back humanity. You sent your word to give us life and that more abundantly. You sent your word and your angels who deliver that word to us. Whoever they are in whatever way. Father, I know that we can feed ourselves. But I know that you dealt with me about being together in your house and encouraging one another and strengthening one another and building each other up because we are entering a time that we need it. And I pray that this is not heavy on your people, but God, it would become the light like somebody turned the light on and and we realize I need them and they need me. We need to build each other up. We need to strengthen each other up. We need to stand together. We need to be united And I pray that that just becomes so real to people. That it's not this, we have to do these things anymore. We realize, God, we make that shift. We make that transition in our mind to where we realize, Father, that we get to do these things. It's our privilege to eat. It's our privilege to have a family. It's our privilege to have those around us who are like-minded. It's our privilege to have the opportunities you give us every single day. Let that become real, I pray. For myself, when I'm having pity parties or whatever we're doing, and anybody else, God, help us to realize we need your word, we need your spirit, and we need each other. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll just record.